and we're doing uh, the whole book in multiple weeks, um, specifically looking at Jesus. Our mission, our vision, our calling here at Inspire is to go deeper with God in our relationship, to draw close to him, to know him better. So we know when to call on him, how to call on him, who he is, who this God is of ours. Um, And as we go deeper with him, then we go out to each other and to our community to love, serve, and bless. So we're in Luke. We've gotten all the way to chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 21 through 23. That's 21, 22, 23. Three verses we're going to look at today. Three verses. Luke 3, 21. When all the people were being baptized, remember we talked about John the Baptist out there, so apparently Jesus was in this crowd. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. We're going to stop there. So last week, we left off when he was 12. And now he's 30, and he's starting his ministry. What happened to Jesus between 12 and 30. So we're going to go on to part two. Why? At 30, why did he wait, what, 18 years to begin his ministry? What was he doing in that time frame? At age 12, we realized last week, he had come at that young age, he had come to understand the relationship with God as God the Father. And that had come through his reading of the Old Testament. He read the Old Testament and he didn't see God as remote. He didn't see God as condemning. He didn't see God as an angry, vengeful God. He came away seeing that God was loving Father at age 12. Came to know this God. Did he also learn his unique calling? As he was reading through the Old Testament, did he realize his unique calling in the same way? At what point did he realize his mission, the fullness of his mission, to get him to the point at age 30 to begin it? And why wait so long to step in? Well, some, when you read, think that Joseph must have died. So maybe Jesus was taking care of familiar duties familial duties. The the carpenter, he was a carpenter. He was making sure the family was stable. And finally, when they were, he could start his ministry. But the fact that Luke mentions specifically that he began around age 30 is very significant and telling. And you'll see in a minute, especially following the last entry about Jesus being age 12 and the specific part in there where it said he was listening and asking questions of the teachers, just as that was an indication of Jesus's childhood education and where he was in the process, so does listing that Jesus was age 30 when he began his ministry. It's a clue as to where his focus was in the past 18 years. And I'm going to walk us through that so we understand a little bit more about who this Jesus is and why he was the way he was in ministry throughout the rest of the gospel. As mentioned last week, Jewish boys who had finished top of their class at the second level of education, the Beth Talmud, that's where they memorized the Tanuk, the rest of the Old Testament. So they had the Torah memorized. That was up to age 10. They had, you know, the first five books of the Bible memorized, no problem, age 10. And then between 10 and 14, they memorized Joshua to Malachi. And they got the rest of that, and they also learned the art of debate, answering questions with questions. And the most brilliant ones that came through that went on further to study. They went to college, or rather, their next leg was more like seminary. At age 14, they were entering the seminary. It's interesting. The intense study lasted until about age 18. But what this time period, specifically between 14 and 18, and it did continue on, that was called the Bet Midrash. The Bet Midrash, meaning the house of study. And their entire focus at this point, they had been selected. The other ones who didn't make the cut went back to doing their father's trade. These boys, then their entire focus was on becoming either a scribe or a rabbi. Now, a scribe was the one that he was a copier and a translator of scripture, but that's not all he did. Scribes actually became experts in scriptural law. They became lawyers. 
for their people. And people look to them as expert of the laws, almost to the equation of Pharisees, Sadducees. They were that high up. So that was a scribe. The other was a rabbi. A rabbi was a teacher of the word of God and also the oral law. A rabbi was the highest position that a, the best of the best Jewish boys they could attain. Now, it's interesting. You look at the word rabbi back in that time period, the biblical Hebrew, the meaning of that, of rabbi, was simply great. To call you rabbi, it was to call you distinguished one. Rabbi, great one. It wasn't until later that it was actually associated with the words teacher, master, and my lord. It was a title of great honor either way. And a first century rabbi spent their life teaching the Jewish people what the scripture said according to accepted interpretations of that time and according to the traditions of that time. More aged master rabbis further down, they were allowed to give their own interpretations of scripture of what it meant, but not a regular rabbi. So this was the track that really gifted boys would be on. We know that Jesus was a gifted young boy. We saw that in the last time we studied when he was age 12, everyone around him said they were astounded and amazed. The the teachers, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of them were amazed. And we know that when he was in ministry, he was referred to often as rabbi. So the question is, was Jesus really a rabbi in the full sense of the word? Was he a rabbi? I don't know about you, but I grew up being taught that he may not have really been an official rabbi. That, you know, his disciples and those who recognize God's call on his life called him this anyway. They were, he was their rabbi. And I don't know if there was a fear that they felt it was too entrenched to say that Jesus actually became a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi. Was that too entrenched in Judaism? Well, it's interesting, given his being raised in the traditional Judaic traditions, his parents, as the Bible says, doing everything according to the laws of Moses, following the customs of the day, and the response that he had gotten at age 12, why wouldn't Jesus have been allowed or gone to follow up his educational track with exactly what was offered at that time for such a young man as him? Why wouldn't he do this to continue on to actually become a rabbi? And how likely would it have been How likely would it have been for so many to refer to him as rabbi, not only his followers, but other religious rulers, scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, those who were, saw him as an enemy. Why would they give him such a title if he truly didn't have the education, the experience, or the reputation that garnered such? Every word that came out of Jesus' mouth His teaching style and so many of his actions indicated that he had spent a lifetime being educated as just that, a rabbi well-versed in knowing how to teach the scriptures and how to lead. Well, we can't say 100% for sure. We'll know that one day. But I think the evidence tips the scales largely in that direction for sure. So this is how it would have worked for a 14-year-old. Jesus turns 14-year-old. He's a 14-year-old teen, which is actually, they turn an adult. They were seen as an adult at age 13, so he'd been an adult for a year at age 14. So one selected to go onward. Once these young men were selected, you're the best of the best, you're going to become a rabbi or a scribe, their next step was to go out and find a local rabbi. They were to find a local rabbi that they respected, and they would hope upon hope that this rabbi would become their rabbi and they could become his Talmud. And his Talmud was the Hebrew word for student or disciple. Rabbis did not go out and seek their own disciples. They were few in number. They had prestige. They had honor and such. Then people came and sought them out. Their students, their Talmudim, they came and sought the rabbi. And so it makes me think, Jesus at age 14, entering into the Bet Midrash school, would he too have sought out a rabbi to mentor him? Have you ever thought about someone mentoring Jesus in rabbihood? Who was his rabbi? Who would have been Jesus' rabbi? And whoever he was, why if he had one? 
which it would make sense according to tradition, why was he never disclosed in the scriptures? Why wasn't he ever mentioned in the Gospels? I have some thoughts on that, some theories, but we'll get to that after we get through the process. We'll go on. Each rabbi... Each rabbi carried a, their own interpretations. They had, their, they had the scriptures, but there were two schools of thought, the Hillel and the Shammai, two different schools of thought of how to interpret the scriptures. They had their traditional interpretations and they had their other ones. So they would choose which rabbi did they seem to connect with most. And if they approached the rabbi and the rabbi thought that this prospective Talmud was worthy of consideration, the next step was then the rabbi would quiz the student. He would quiz him to see how well did he know the Torah, how well did he know the Tanuk, the rest of the scripture, and how able was he to put it to debate. When he'd ask a question, was he able to ask questions back, and how good was he at it? The understanding of the Talmud had to line up in very tight order with the interpretation that that particular rabbi had of the scriptures. The rabbi's reputation was on the line because of what the students were going to be learning and espousing therefore going forward. And so if he chose to be associated with this student, he wanted to know he could trust this student would carry on his traditions, his understandings, his interpretations. And so the testing was extremely grueling, extremely grueling. If the young man passed, and the rabbi thought he had it in him to become a rabbi or a scribe like himself, then he would tell the Talmud, take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. Those were the young words. Those were the words that every young Jewish boy desired to hear so he could enter into the Bet Midrash. It meant he was now accepted. When that rabbi told him, take my yoke upon you, that means I'm accepted, I'm in. Does it ring kind of other scriptures we've heard said? We'll come to that. By taking the rabbi's yoke, it meant that the student was willing to take on all the rabbi's interpretations of the Torah as his own. It meant he would become his disciples and do all the work that was required ahead of him. The young boy was then required to leave his father, to leave his mother, to leave his family, to leave his work, any family business, and devote his entire life to following this rabbi everywhere. The studies in the Bet Midrash were intensely focused on the oral and written laws. And of course, they were now memorizing and learning those oral and written laws according to the interpretations of their rabbi. They also, during this time between 14 and 18, were learning about the ancient sages and their years and years of commentaries on the scriptures. They were taking all this in. They also learned their languages, not only the Hebrew, but the, the common Greek. They were learning that as well at this time. They would enter into passionate discussions about what the other rabbis were teaching as their interpretations of the scripture, and they'd have heated debates their abilities to uphold their own understandings while still yet yearning, learning, it was all being refined during this time. And in Judaism, during this whole time of, of intense study, this to the Jew was the highest form of worship. Now think about that for a minute. When you and I, when we study the scriptures, when, when we open the Bible to look, when we have our devotionals and it has scripture in there that we're putting to memory or we're being encouraged and we're studying the scriptures, do we think about that as our intense time of worship? I think it's a beautiful thought because as we seek to know scripture, hopefully we'll be seeking to know God through those scriptures. Not just the facts, but the person behind it. And you think about for a moment, as you seek to know better someone that you love, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your spouse, your, your friend, your child, anyone, it is a form of love and adoration. When you want to truly know the other deeply, you truly want to dig in, you want to hear the stories, you want to get to know them as intimately as possible, all the details, that's worship. That's what happens when we study to know God more. He takes that as worship. And John 17, 3 says, now this, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. 
Well, if the rabbi traveled, the Talmudim, the students, traveled with him. Because every detail of the rabbi's life, not just his knowledge, but every detail of the rabbi's life was copied, including his walk, his talk, and his mannerisms. The rabbi's job was to teach his students, testing them along the way continuously to make sure they are becoming just like him because they are going to be passing on all that he knows about God. There's a prayer that comes from the Mishnah that says, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi, meaning that you followed your rabbi so closely that you got covered with his dust. And that was considered of great honor. By the time the young man turned 18, he would have been considered ready for marriage. And this was a turning point at 18. It was a time of division once again. Those who had been doing well through, the, through, the, through this time of uh, study, if they were brilliant and dedicated and they were made to go on, then they would be allowed to continue. And those who weren't likely to make it, this is another door closing for them in their journey. And they were told, it's time for you to go ply your trade with your father. Those were the words every Talmud dreaded to hear. He wanted to continue on, but he had to go back to the trade of his father. Now this select group, which I believe Jesus would have been a part of, this select group was even more select as they continued their education under their rabbi. By the time the student and the rabbi had come this far together, following his every gesture and move everywhere he went, they had an extremely close relationship, the, the, the rabbi and his disciples. The disciple was becoming like the teacher until it was time to be launched. And when finally the Talmud completed the necessary course of study, at the end, he was given a written document known as a semicha. And this essentially was his doctorate degree. So a rabbi at the end got a certificate of authority, the semicha, a doctorate degree, which confirmed he did indeed have authority as a rabbi. And these rabbinical doctors became more distinguished than the scribes at that point. So once he graduated and turned 30, a rabbi would begin his public ministry. That's when he was allowed to launch. He would launch as either a Torah rabbi teaching at the synagogues, or he would teach in the schools, teach the children in the same steps that he had gone through to learn and become just like they had. Now, while being a rabbi meant a lifetime of studying the concept of Judaism, there were very few who went on even further in their studies, and they were called master rabbis. And how that would work is when you would turn 40, that's across the board, you would turn 40, that's when it was understood that you finally now, at age 40, have the wisdom to understand all of scripture. You were doing fine before, and we'll give you a rabbi title, but not until you're 40 do you really understand the scriptures. And not until you're 50, not until you're 50, can you start counseling people? And that meant not until age 50 can you start getting disciples to come around you. Not until age 50 are you allowed to interpret or reinterpret scripture. Then once you did, you were becoming in the process of being a wise, aged old man and a master rabbi. So this is the background. This is the process. What's the likelihood that Jesus was a rabbi? from age 14 to age 30. I want to take you through the steps and show where I believe, again, he was. According to Jewish, Jewish tradition, if one was studying to be a rabbi, what? You can't enter public ministry until age 30. Luke 3.23 says Jesus enters his ministry, his public ministry, at age 30. The work of the rabbi was teaching in the synagogues and the schools. Luke 4, 15, and 16 says immediately the first thing out of the gate, he taught in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom and he stood up to read. Now from here, it gets more interesting. There is definitely evidence, and we're going to go through that to confirm that Jesus would likely have been a rabbi. And it makes it clear, as we see where he deviated, why his mentor rabbi, whoever he may have been, may not have wanted to lay claim to Jesus as his student. 
Remember, a rabbi never was supposed to seek out his own Talmudim, his own students, his own disciples, until he was how old? 50. He's distinguished. He doesn't seek his own. They come to him. What does Jesus do? At age 30, first thing out of the gate, he seeks out disciples and he says, follow me. Follow me. Few sought him out and asked if they could follow him and go along with him. But Jesus predominantly does the opposite of tradition. He reverses the idea of a rabbi sitting high and mighty waiting for others to come to him. Jesus from the beginning is the one that shows seeking out, taking initiative, breaking down the walls between high and low, between us versus them. And he gives a picture of a God who does the same. At age 30, 20 years before he's even supposed to be breathing those kind of things. Number two, when a disciple came to the rabbi and the rabbi finally accepted him after much grueling testing, what did he say to them? Take my yoke upon you. Those words ring, right? The disciples were finally in at that point. Well, Jesus in Matthew 11, he says the same thing, right? Take my yoke upon you, the same line, except he leads with, come to me all, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Not I'm going to put you through the rigors, I'm here to bring you life and breath. So take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, he says, and humble in heart, and you will find rest, not more work, rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I think Jesus could have used those words because he knew full well the burden of being under a rabbi's yoke. All that he had to do and endure to be the cream of the crop, to be acceptable. And these rabbis were the ones who said they know God best. They know what God's requirements are for mankind. And Jesus said, no way. No way. This is not what God's about. And with that, I think he put another nail in the coffin for his good reputation as a rabbi. Number three, when it comes to commitment, Jesus taught the same as the rabbis. He makes it clear in Luke 9 and 14 that commitment to him, full undivided commitment was absolutely necessary, just like the rabbis called for their students. If you want to learn my ways and be like me, you must be willing to make me your priority at all times. We're going to live all of life together, just like the rabbis of old And in these chapters, Jesus talks about the importance of leaving mother, leaving father, leaving family, leaving the business, whatever is required to follow him, which is a requirement for any good rabbi. It's interesting because number four, Jesus makes it very clear that he wants his disciples to be like him. Again, very much like a good rabbi. But it's interesting what exactly Jesus emphasizes is of most importance to become like him. It was absolutely clear to disciples with their rabbis as they were following. When you follow your rabbi, the rabbi sets the standard for everything. You live, you breathe, you become like your rabbi. So what does Jesus teach his disciples in this way? There are many places, of course, where Jesus instructs how people are to live. But when he gets specific as to do as I have done, there are just a handful of verses that he gets that specific on. And what are they? The ones I could find when he washes his disciples' feet, when he shows by example what it means to serve, that is when he says, do as I have done. When he teaches them, I have a new command to give you, love one another as I have loved you. That's number two. Serve like I have served, love as I have loved. And the third one I could find, obey my commands as I have obeyed my father's commands. Do as I have done. But then he goes on to specify, and my command to you is this, love each other as I have loved you. The rabbis of that time were all about law. 
and being separate from the unholy. But Jesus, as rabbi, set a completely different standard. He led with love and service, the kind of love that isn't turned away from washing feet, the kind of love that serves instead of being served. The first shall be last. This was the kind of rabbi Jesus was. And five, I think Jesus must have really upset the rabbi regime when he disregarded the age tradition. Again, we, we know that from the gate, he called people to follow him instead of waiting for them to come to him. But from, from the get-go, what do we see again in the scriptures when it comes to interpretation? Jesus says, you've heard it said. You've heard it said, but I tell you this. You've heard it said, but I tell you. He wasn't, as a rabbi, was not supposed to be reinterpreting the scriptures at age 30, but here he was. He knew full well the stories and teachings of tradition that was in line with the Pharisees. He told the same stories, those parables that we're going to learn about, those sayings that Jesus has. Those were commonly known stories and phrases from the Jewish tradition of the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, all of them, except Jesus twists the endings. He changes up the endings so the meanings are different. He knew the Old Testament inside and out. He would have understood the God that they saw from what was there. And yet, he reads the same scriptures and he rejects the God that they were purporting, the God of condemnation, and establishes a new view of the true Father who rules a kingdom of love and forgiveness. To me, it's clear that Jesus had training of a rabbi, the way he talked, the way he taught, but at some point, he used what he learned as a leaping off spot for getting to a new place, a new kingdom. Now, my question as I'm reading this, I'm saying, how did he get to that kind of open-mindedness? How did Jesus have that to read the same scriptures that all these others had been reading? And he walks away with a different version. There's one commentary who says his version of religion, of kingdom, of God, were not from any particular culture, ethnic group, religion. It was a unique blending. How did he get there? How did he have the ability to see beyond traditions? How was he able to, to go beyond accepted understandings of scripture and God to discern what was okay and what needed to be refined or reshaped or recycled or rejected altogether? He clearly had the language and the educational background. He had deep comprehension of scripture, but he saw a God and a way of life differently than those that taught him. How did he get there? Now, the first response I thought was, okay, well, God taught him. God taught him. Okay, I believe that. I believe that God, Jesus, was given the Holy Spirit. God spoke to him. He clearly had a close relationship with God the Father. But how did God teach him? Perhaps more than just one way, more than just spirit with spirit, spirit to mind. I'd like to go back to what we touched on last week just briefly and expand a bit about where God planted Jesus. Because our environment how we are raised, the place in which we interact affects our understandings. Where God planted Jesus was in the center of Galilee. And as you remember, this is a very open environment. He chose to have Jesus raised where there would be opportunities to mix with people and philosophies and ways of thinking and being in this region. And we cannot disregard the intentionality of purpose and the impact it would have had on Jesus on his development, on his interpretations of scripture, on his practices. To help you further understand how impacting his environment would have been, when you think of Galilee, think of 1960s Berkeley. Galilee was the Berkeley of Palestine. It was known at that time for its radicalness and its severe independence in thought, in politics, and religion. This region was regarded as almost quasi-anarchist. Because when the Jews had settled there, here this Jewish nation, they were this loose tribal confederacy who made it clear they were ruled by no one but God, directly from God. And so they weren't interested in making alliances with or showing loyalty to kings or other foreign rulers, more so than the politically-minded Jerusalemites of the South. Resistance to the political regime largely came from Galilee. 
This was partly because this was a land of mixed peoples. While the Jewish peoples had settled there, they had the coast of the Mediterranean, and there was a Roman highway that ran north and south through there. And so the crisscross land was full of international travelers, and those that settled there added the diversity of ethnic makeup, bringing their culture, their religious practices, their societal understandings. All of that was the environment in which Jesus was raised. The word Galilee, the Hebrew word for it is Galil. It means circle, and why it's called Galil is because it was encircled by non-Jewish nations. All the nations around Galilee were non-Jewish. Greek cities, cosmopolitan cities that were in walking distance to Nazareth. They had sporting arenas and theaters and the best schools. These, as we mentioned last week, would have been places Jesus and his father as a carpenter would have walked to to have clients. What a great avant-garde, postmodern place to be raised in, right? Except to an old Jew, they wouldn't have seen it as such. A Jew who had settled in Judea and Jerusalem, Galilee was not great. It was looked down upon. Galilee to them meant outsider. The Jews there had settled only 100 to 150 years before Jesus was born. It was fairly new. They were welcoming to interactions with other nations and religions. They were loose with the Torah. Archaeological finds found that, particularly the second commandment, not to have graven images or idols, they were a little bit more loose on that in the northern region. They were troublesome and suspect, way too open to new ideas. They were a mixed race, much like Samaria. True Jews, true Jews knew that salvation would come from pure Jewish blood. That meant Judean or the Jerusalem out of Zion's hill, certainly not from the likes of a town called Nazareth in the rebellious region of Galilee from a rabbi who too often didn't follow or teach the known right ways of the law. And yet here was Jesus. With this background, his openness to me makes sense because of where he, come, where he had come from. An openness of mind and spirit that was needed to be able to see the true heart of God in the Old Testament and to see the true mission woven into the scriptures where others had missed it. I just want to pause here because it made me wonder, maybe we too need to pay attention to where we are today. Where has God planted you? Where has God allowed you to live, to work? Perhaps you struggle and you wonder what your purpose is, but perhaps you being there is for the purpose he has for you. Perhaps he has plans to use all of it, your environment included, to better build your understanding and your relationship with him, to see things from a perspective he needs to have you see, he needs out there in the world to serve others in just the way that's missing, to be salt and light and to clear the pathways for God to be seen for who he truly is in a way that isn't being done, to see a God who is for us, not against us. Realizing all this makes sense that Jesus would end up being this rebellious rabbi. And to me, if he had a rabbi that he had chosen to be a mentor, to me it makes sense that he would absolutely want to completely disassociate himself from Jesus. This was someone who, from the gate, was pretty much called a heretic. Why would he want his name, his reputation, smudged by the misinterpretations and misrepresentings of the scriptures by someone who got in trouble with the law? I can't imagine he would say, nope, strike my name off the record. I don't want to be associated. Well, to top it off, and in conclusion, Jesus joins up with John the Baptist, as we just read this morning. He joins up with John the Baptist, this radical, itinerant preacher, and he gets baptized, something no Jew believed he had to do or needed to do, especially not a learned rabbi. But here's Jesus doing what he wasn't supposed to do again. Interesting, though, it's what the Essenes were known for, immersing themselves in water to symbolize being completely cleansed, to show full commitment and a new way of life. 
And Jesus being open to new ways, perhaps wanting to identify with the people that he would be serving, or maybe Jesus just needed to feel the reality of fully going under, of fully dying to self and rising to his ministry, full commitment to God, come what may. Perhaps it was the needed restart for Jesus' soul, a rebirth from rabbi of the law to rabbi of love, of the true God. I'm convinced that Jesus was educated and followed the way of the rabbi as long as he could, until he saw it was time to take the road not traveled, to find a God that needed to be found and made known. And no doubt there were questions and aspersions thrown his way because of his background, because of where he lived, because he deviated from the norm. And we're gonna see those throughout the book of Luke. And maybe he had some of his own questions. Were his different ways of thinking about God truly of God? Were his interpretations of scripture sound? He was about to launch his whole ministry based on what he had read and how he interpreted it. Did he truly understand the unique mission he felt called to? And perhaps stepping into the water that day was his way of wanting to come completely clean, to empty himself before God of anything that may not be right. If I've read this wrong, God, if I'm not on the right path here, let me know but I want to truly be free of anything that is me and be completely, totally committed to you, God. That perhaps was his step of baptism. And what happens when he steps out of the water? The Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove, it says. It's like God can't help but run to him, to rush to him, to fly to him, and let him feel his spirit on him. Heaven opens, and all within the earshot, here the voice of God says, you are my son. Do not doubt. You are my son whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. Those are words that were directly from the Psalms and Isaiah, that every time they were heard or interpreted, it meant that related to the Messiah, the chosen one. And those are the words God chose to speak to Jesus in his very beginning. When at this crossroads, imagine the relief and the confidence to step into what was before him. Words chosen to assure Jesus that rebellious rabbi of love was exactly what God needed and who God had called him to be. And he was indeed on the path he was supposed to be, and God would be with him. We're going to be studying and looking at Jesus' life going forward, and hopefully that background that we've been looking at as who Jesus was leading him to do the ministry he did and to share the God he shared, why that was so and how we can draw closer to him as we continue to study his word. Let's stand and pray. I wish, God, that you were here in physical form. We could see fully to put our arms around you and thank you and praise you and hug you we can't wait till we can do that. But God, you've given us so many scriptures and stories and wise people that you've inspired to give us history and background about who you are, who you were then, who you are today, that can help at least our hearts feel like we can be close to you and hug you and thank you and praise you. And so God, as we go forward, as we... As we go and continue to study the book of Luke, as we look at your words and your actions, may we be your Talmudim, your disciples, your followers, your students, that we will walk so closely that the dust of your sandals will be on us. And we will be so close to you through our study. 
We thank you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.